Let's call the meeting to order. And Francesca, would you please do the roll call? Commissioner Castagna? Here. Commissioner Evans? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Present. Commissioner Sovereign? Here. Commissioner Wall? Oh, you're muted, Commissioner Wall. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. I said I just made it and I didn't really. <laughs> Vice Chair Wachowski. Present. Chair O'Neill. Here. Thank you. Thank you. We're all here then. And we have uh, consent items on the agenda. Is there, is there any public comment before that? Anybody want to comment on the consent agenda? You put it that way. We have no um, outside viewers who want to comment on that. Not for the consent. Okay, thank you. And uh, the item on the consent agenda is approval of the minutes of the March 22nd, 2021 meeting. Are there comments from the commissioners on the minutes? I move approval. Second. Who is the second? Mr. Evans. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any more comments? All right, then I guess we call the roll on that. Commissioner Castagna? Yes. Commissioner Evans? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Sovereign? Yes. Commissioner Wall? Approve. Vice Chair Bukowski? Yes. Chair O'Neill. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion is carried unanimously. That's the end of the consent agenda. And now we have an opportunity for the public to comment on any items not on our agenda today. And we do encourage members of the public to join our meeting via ZoomGov, a secure service for use by government agencies. You will be connected live in real time to the meeting. This meeting is also streamed live on youtube.com forward slash city of Monterey with an approximate 10 second delay and then Comcast channel 25 with an approximate 90 second delay. If you plan to make a public comment, please join the meeting using Zoom or by telephone and ensure you join in time to accommodate the delay. To join the meeting on Zoom, use the link or phone number on the Museums and Cultural Arts Commission agenda at isearchmonterey.org to join by telephone, dial toll free 833-568-8864. Enter meeting ID 161-622-2299, followed by the pound sign. If prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. To make a public comment, raise your Zoom hand, or if you are connected by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand. Chair Evans, there are no public callers at this time. Ma'am. So the first item is to receive uh, a report on museums and cultural arts divisions monthly activity report. Yes, so uh, perhaps artifact specialist Jordan Blinger could walk us through some of the items on there and then I'll, I'll pick up at the end. All right. Hello, everyone. Hey, so starting with planning and projects on April 12th, I supervised the return of our two Francis McComas paintings. Um, Symphony of Historic Monterey was turned to the return to the city council chambers and Toledo Bridge was returned to the library. And luckily we had help from the museum art museum because the Toledo Bridge is a very big uh, painting and that was a lifesaver. So we we're happy to have those paintings back and in our proper places. Um, let's see, and I am continuing to still maintain and um, check on our sites bi-weekly or as needed um, just to make sure things are going uh, smoothly. 
and so far there, there's nothing to report on the, the museums and other sites. And, and I'm still continuing to work on the Presidio Monterey collection. Um, I'm having a lot of fun just seeing what we have in our collection, things I haven't seen yet. And um, so that is still, that's gonna be ongoing um, for the foreseeable future. And I'm still attending the monthly Monterey Regional Collections Roundtables uh, meetings via Zoom. And nothing to report on those. Everything is still just kind of slow. Um, just depends on how each institution is faring during this pandemic. And lastly, on this last Friday, April 23rd, I met with the Communication and Public Information Officer, Lori Huaga, for the city. And we met with a new Monterey Weekly reporter, Chris Neely, and I was there to help give a tour of the city campus and other historical sites within the city. We went on a, a little walk and just talked about the city. He's just moved here from Texas, so he doesn't know anything about Monterey. No. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, not at all. And so he he was very surprised at the, you know, the history and the the vast culture that we have within our city. And so we just emphasized on how proud we are of th this area. And it was, it was a lot of fun to be able to talk to someone again about history in person. Um, and I think that concludes everything for the, this report for me. Jordan, can you speak to the, the increase in the cell phone tours? They went from 67 to 136. To me, that uh, and do we do we have a breakdown at all of those numbers? It seems to me then we have more people or more tourists looking around and checking out the cell phone tours. I, I don't have that breakdown, but I would. We can break say. it down. I um I'm the one that pulls that data from our uh, vendor, and I can. Uh, give you a greater breakdown. Uh, do you mean like where are tourists coming from? As as what I recall is that they're pr primarily from California, um, whereas in the past we've seen them from all over the world. But um, and last month I think when I looked at where in California it's primarily in the Bay Area. So I can double check that and see. If I, think I was more I was more interested. And what sites are they seeing? Are they looking at Colton Hall? Are they looking at the Lower Presidio? Are they where yeah, are they? Row. Yeah, I can take a look and see if the um, database will tell us uh, that kind of detail. Yeah, I mean, but I don't I do want you think... to do a lot of work. I'm just curious, you know, what what's what areas, what general areas are they going to? Yeah, I think it's really indicative, though, um, that. Uh, we have people, uh, we have tourists in town and um, they're discovering the cell phone tour because the facilities themselves are closed. So uh, it's sort of similar to at the library, we saw a huge jump in use of our online books, our eBooks, um, you know, because people couldn't get in the doors. So they looked at our website and they're like, oh my gosh, you have all these, um, you know, for free, it's for free for them. Uh, ebooks that they can read or listen to. And I think a similar thing's happening, but it shows interest. What I wanted to uh, add is um, last month, I, uh, the commissioners asked about reopening of the museums. And so I just wanted to reiterate what was said last month, um, because there was a question from a commissioner about when will the museums be reopening. So first of all, just a reminder that the commission prioritized the museums and was thinking Colton Hall should open first and uh, then the Presidio Museum. And uh, depending on um, social distancing, you know, we would have to see when tours could resume at uh, PBL. So uh, what the city manager has said to me is that there's a prioritization for uh, facilities reopening and um, he wants to see the library open before museums and the library unfortunately can't reopen even though if we had the funding we could 
um, because there are no restrictions right now for libraries on um, how many people can use the building. But uh, we're waiting for the new fiscal year and to see if we have the adequate funds for staffing and then that will help us determine open hours and days of the week. So we're keeping our fingers crossed about that. So then, then um, my understanding then would be is uh, because of the prioritization that the commission has made, um, Colton Hall would be our first priority. I wonder if Nat could speak to, I mean, I think we raised this question last time. Yes. The, I mean, I understand the library to reopen that you need a certain amount of um, staffing there and it can't be done with volunteers. But we had two volunteers that are ready to go at Colton Hall. And I know your time is pressed, uh, Inga, but they can report to Jordan. They're ready to uh, go. Why, why can't we have the Colton Hall Museum open? Why do we have to wait until the library's open? I don't understand the connection. Yep, and uh, you know it's a it's a it's a good question, and I don't know Inga if you have any more uh, uh, information to to share on on that, but uh, I, I just do know that uh, with our priorities and, uh, and and the financial resources that we have, uh, there's challenges. But if we have volunteers, we could certainly go back and take a look and, and have that conversation and see what we uh, what we can do. I, I think just overall, we've uh, looking at protocols of what when do we reopen and you look at uh, what what the state parks is doing we're just uh, trying to prioritize as best as, as we can and uh, and I don't know Inga, if you have anything else to add Nat that doesn't answer my question why did the city manager say Colton Hall can't open until after the library's open there's no what's the relate where did where does that come from I don't understand it yeah, and I don't know. If, honestly, I'm not sure if uh, if, if uh, I, I certainly haven't heard that specific uh, statement. But we can. Uh, that was my understanding that the the city manager was prioritizing which facilities open, and it sort of sends a message to our community. Well, and he was thinking that the museums should reopen after the well, library. Well, the, just to put a different. Uh, uh, angle on it uh, from what Bill is saying. If the library burned down for some reason and wasn't going to open for 10 years, does that mean we'd have to wait 10 <laughs> years to open the museum? <laughs> well, yeah, I just repeating what he said in a different weird way. <laughs> right, and I, I can see that there is an interest in um, reopening the museums because tourists yeah. are coming back. Yeah. And I think the clientele is is potentially quite different. I don't know, don't see a lot of the visitors going to the library, uh, whereas the visitors would go to the museums or at least Colton Hall. Um, and if anything, we want to provide more things for them to do so they'll stay overnight, which increases TOT. Well, I agree with the prioritization of the library. I think that should be first. But if you have a choice of one or the other, and one, the library can't open for some reason, why not go to choice number two? Well, the other component there is, yes, the libra library ought to be open before many of our uh, community centers are open. Um, but again, I think you're looking at two different clientele, um, the museums or visitors in general, and although, if I have visitors, I will take them to the, to the uh, Colton Hall. Um, so there is some uh, participation on the part of residents. But um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Bill. Um, th there's not, not really a good connection there, it would seem to me. And, and uh, just to clarify what Bill was saying is we have a couple of um, part-time staff, hourly staff, who had said that they were ready to return and there's the funding in this year's budget that was to pay for part-time staff. So I think that, um, I'm not so sure about volunteers being yeah. ready. The great thing about the people who've worked for us before is they're trained, they know um, the stories and the history and the protocols and that sort of thing. 
even if they were open, you know, and I respect Hans Usler quite a bit as the city manager, but I don't know if, if the priority on opening and other stuff, the city manager's office makes recommendations to the council and the council decides, right? And in this case, I just, um, for the reasons stated by Bob and John, I just think the visitors are dying to find something open. I mean, after a while, cell phone tour is only so much and they want to go inside a building. And maybe if we led the way on the museum with these two part-time people that are already budgeted, that might prompt the state uh, parks and Monterey History and Art to open up Casa Serrano and the Custom House or whatever. I think Jordan the, had something to say. Oh, I was just going to add that that I had been told years ago that we can't have volunteers at Colton Hall, that I think there was some kind of ordinance in place that it has to be paid employees. So that was just a, to add on to what Bill was mentioning with volunteers. But um, I think, yeah, that's what I had. So it sounds like uh, we'll take these comments back to our city manager and have uh, more of a discussion about it. I do know that um, because of the emergency um, ordinance that was put into place that the closing and then reopening, um, a lot of that was delegated to city manager, especially um, authorization to use any reopening funds. So um, yeah, not, ordinarily, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. ordinarily there is that step of um, making a recommendation to council. But right now I think it's slightly different because of the emergency status. And Nat, can you say something about that? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's very true. Uh, Inga's uh, point is correct. Uh, you know, typically uh, when we have items that are budgeted, we, we go through the process, doesn't need to go through a, a rigorous review process of bringing back uh, even part-time staff but uh, we're looking closely at every single position, whether it's uh, a part-time position or a full-time position to ensure that we can actually sustain it and don't have to end up hiring part-time staff or, or even full -time, let alone full-time staff and end up having to then lay staff off again if we end up in a fiscal situation where we can't afford it. And on, on the surface, it looks like, oh, two part-time staff, only a, a few hours uh, a day for a few days a week isn't uh, a lot. Uh, but when we are struggling enough with uh, trying to uh, find the staff to just this morning talking about how are we going to staff the preschool programs for, for those who have needs for daycare or preschool for the three programs and the three classes that we currently have, it's 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 a fiscal challenge, and um, I can't emphasize uh, enough how dire uh, the financial situation is. We see the tourists out there, and and they're they're visiting on weekends. They're bringing in TOT, and that's great because they do. They they expect to see go to the museum. I understand those all those points, and, and as a city manager's office, we understand um, and all of all of that. The, uh, the unfortunately, the fiscal reality when you look at TOT. Uh, sales tax, for example, we just yesterday looked at the sales tax numbers. It, it's below what we had projected. Uh, so in two days on Wednesday, uh, we invite you to, to join our budget meeting uh, and, and just to listen in on, on um, our conversation as it relates to the budget because it's uh, unfortunately not as, uh, not as strong as, as, as we'd hope and the fiscal impact is, is great. Uh, when you have a $34 million deficit uh, due to uh, due to the COVID, and the federal government through the American Rescue Plan Act is only planning to provide us with six point five million dollars in revenue. Mm. Uh, you, it's a little a little difficult, uh, and that's an understatement. I'm, I'm being sarcastic now. Uh, apologies for that. It's a little hard to figure out. Okay, every single dollar does count at the end of the day. It really does, and it's and it's it's hard. We've told our employees we, we don't want to have any more layoffs. And, and that's why our reopening has been extremely careful and ex extremely frugal. And that's been the case as it relates to all of the areas of service throughout the city. And, uh, and, and it's hard, but I, bottom line, I appreciate the feedback. This is helpful. We'll, we'll go back and, and talk, figure out, okay, what does this look like? Can we afford to hire back? Can we, can we run it with, with volunteers? There might be ways that we're not 
and we can talk offline, Inga and I will will discuss further, and, and Hans as well, on on what we can do. Uh, but I just can't can't emphasize enough the fiscal reality that we're in, and and how dire the situation is, and how much even though we we see tourists out there, and, and the weekends might be busy, we rely a lot in the city as uh, on the convention business, on business travel, which we we know is uh, is non-existent right now because of the lack of conferences so uh, that's kind of where, where we are as a city financially and uh, I appreciate everyone's patience through this i'd like to raise a point along that line and are, are we connected yes okay uh this is not just a museum function that these people do Colton Hall is the very visible thing which you see if you come into Monterey, if you're a tourist. And the people there at, Monterey, at the Colton Hall can tell people what is also available and, and get them so that they know, you know that there are additional things that they want to see so they'll stay overnight. Um, and we we could, I'm sure, if 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 the current staffing people, who I I I, I know and, and they're experienced and everything, but maybe we need to provide another, you know, person with them to handle other questions than the museum. But but they're very capable of showing people what is available in Monterey beyond that building and and that function i think is is really important to get uh the visitors to visit and more than just you know an hour or two if we want them to stay overnight uh yes and i think that um because jordan has been participating in the round table, we are getting information about the other facilities that are opening. So I think there's some synergy there with, um, and uh, uh, Commissioner Wachowski asked about when is the art museum on Pacific Street opening? They're, they're planning to reopen on May 9th. And so you can see as these different museums or different sort of tourists attractions, for lack of a better word, um, open up, then we can promote one another. And as um, Commissioner Sovereign says, it will keep people in Monterey for longer, spending, you know, funds on food and possibly lodging as things open up. I'd like to offer a comment. Uh, thank Nat for picking up on what uh, Jordan said about using volunteers if there's a reason we can't use them i think we should investigate that how many of the other historic structures in monterey uh in the state park system at least are open because volunteers do that even when they're fully funded it's volunteers operating a lot of those places so i i think there's they can do it. We know from other places it may be just that the city has to agree to do something like that. I have a question. Sure. Is the uh, jail part of Colton Hall? In other words, if Colton Hall opens, then they'll unlock the jail. Normally, there's nobody at the jail, but I've seen lots of people go in and read all the signs. And uh, you know, could it be open even if? Colton Hall is not open since I mean obviously somebody has to go there and lock it up and that sort of thing so there's a certain amount of effort involved but it seems to me that that would be an easy one to open good point and there again that's another one why why it would be interesting to know the data down to the phone down to the uh, cell phone level to see you know what what the numbers are um, on, let's say, the jail compared to Colton Hall, compared to uh, Maccabee Beach, et cetera. Yes, that would be interesting to see. So I'll see if I can pull that data. Uh, Jordan, who usually opened and then closed? Was that part of what the museum attendants do? 
Yes, correct. The museum attendants would open the jail at the beginning of their shift and then close it afterwards. So it, it would just be open from 10 to 10 to 4 every day. Mm -hmm. And then I'd imagine, I, I don't know what the museum regulations are, but it could be a problem opening the jail right now and not maintain, like, a, I, I doubt it would happen, but it could happen that more people capacity could go in there than allowed and there's no one to monitor it. So that would have to be something that we'd have to look into. Right. So right now, museums can open at 50% capacity. And the Lower Presidio Historic Park, for instance, is open, but it's such a big open space that there's not a concern about um, an outdoor museum uh, exceeding its capacity at this point. But the jail is a good, good point. It's, you know, one entrance in and out and it would be possible that um, more people might enter than would be optimal. My, my, further? my libertarian son-in-law would say that the, the people will take care of themselves. They'll wait outside so that they maintain their social distancing. But <laughs> who knows what the rules are? Where does he live? <laughs> We could put up a sign, either social distance or you'll stay overnight in the jail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good point. Actually, that could be a revenue generator. People might yes. think that would be fun to <laughs> camp overnight in a jail. You may be onto something, yes. <laughs> Give them a bucket. There's worse places to stay overnight. Those those cots aren't aren't too bad, I think. So uh. yeah, it looks like feather pillows. <laughs> they have done fundraisers in the past where they put like the mayor and upper management people in the jail cells, and you have to raise money to either break them. I don't remember how exactly it went, but they used to put people in there for fundraisers. Yeah, run that by Clyde and <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> might be a reason why they haven't done it lately. <laughs> Okay, any other discussion on this topic? Well, thank you, uh, Inga and Jordan for that report. And we'll move on to our next item, which is to approve a staff recommendation regarding disposition of the San Xavier cannery warehouse objects. Would okay. you like to? Okay. Sure, so I'll just, uh, give a quick verbal overview. So um, these objects were a gift to the city of Monterey um, back in 1997 by the folks that uh, purchased the land down on Cannery Row that was going to be developed. And um, the city accepted did the gift of objects and uh, created an index and took photographs of everything. And um, they've been in storage ever since. So uh, currently they are in a location where, and there were over a hundred objects, um, and in a location where the, um, the warehouse that they're in is gonna be torn down and uh, they wanted us to uh, remove everything by May. And so here we are on the 26th of April. We don't have a whole lot of time at this point to uh, get a lot of um, big, heavy pieces of equipment out of there. So um, the recommendation, so I uh, took a tour of the objects with our fisheries historian, Tim Thomas, and um, Kent Seavey, who is a historian of architecture and a preservation uh, consultant. And um, uh, one of the hopes all, uh, uh, early on by city staff was that some of the pieces might be appropriate installed along the recreation trail with some interpretive signage. And so I, I looked for pieces that might be appropriate for uh, that kind of use. And it's possible that some of the steaming, the steaming baskets be 
uh, located along Cannery Row. And um, then uh, the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, uh, expressed an interest if we were deaccessioning some of these pieces that they would be willing to accept some. And then I was told that the Italian, um, an Italian group was also potentially interested. So the recommendation is that uh, we remove a few pieces and store them in the East Garage for potential um, installation along the recreation trail and that we offer pieces to the Japanese American Citizens League and the Italian Heritage Society and that we offer the pieces to the folks that are developing the property on Cannery Row and also that uh, staff get a quote from a demolition company uh, as well. Um, yeah, I've always had a vision that um, we could have a walking historic outdoor park in Shoreline Park. Shoreline Park is the area between Fisherman's Wharf and the, now the new basketball courts between Lighthouse Curve and the Rec Trail. There's one large piece of cannery equipment. And I just thought in that area, it's pretty shaded. It's not, it's not the most attractive area, but I thought with, a, with some careful attention with the landscape architect that we could get some safe pieces and rope them off and whatever, and people could divert off the rec trail and walk along Shoreline Park and see these you know, uh, interesting pieces of the Cannery Row, um, uh, history. And again, there is one large piece there now. I, I don't, that's, that's been there for 30 or 40 years. So, and I realized during their timeline, we can always ask Tamsi to delay it a little bit, but I, I would, I would hope that we were able to use some of these both at that location in Shoreline Park and Mike Sovereign and I had met with the aquarium about, uh, possibly some of that could be in the worker shacks area where again, with signing and roping and all that, we can take care of the safety aspect and again, introduce people to more of the Cannery Row history. I'd like to think bigger than that. I think those are good ideas, but the Cannery, the Ocean View Plaza, I don't believe is gonna be built. Number one, they have no water and haven't had water all this time. They were proposing a desal plant in the parking structure underneath the ocean side part of their proposed development. And of course that's gonna be underwater before very long. The Coastal Commission has uh, refused uh, the most recent proposals and has a whole list of reasons why it should not be built there. Um, and so I think we should think bigger that that area should be a park um, and a parking lot. It, it's a parking lot now and the parking lot has stuff that we're, that even the developer hasn't really figured out how he's gonna compensate for the Native American remains and the toxic stuff that's buried there. So I think there are a lot of challenges to having that developed and it's the only space along the rec trail where you can see the ocean. And when they build the buildings there, that view will essentially go away. So that was one of the reasons that we got them to eliminate one building. So there might be some little slices. Also, they were supposed to, to um, rehab uh, Stohans and make it into a museum. And my understanding was that, that uh, from talking to Daryl Stokes, who was there for many years, that most of the, uh, or at least a good example of what a fish reduction plant was like, the machinery is was there behind plywood pieces that he'd put up. So he had his little art gallery in there. Um, they also apparently, the owners of the Ocean View Plaza apparently um, when they were deconstructing supposedly the warehouse uh, because it was in imminent danger of falling over, which it actually wasn't. Um, 
have stored some of the architectural materials um, because that building was like the building up on a wave, uh, but actually larger than the one on the wave. So I would hate to see us um, simply get rid of all this stuff. In walking through there today, I was amazed at all of the, the stuff that's there and the potential for putting back together uh, a canning line, it looked like to me. Uh, there are machinery for doing um, like centrifuges to squeeze the oil out of the remaining uh, stuff that go, comes out of the cleaning and, uh, and canning fish and so on and so forth. Um, and the, the other thing I think about that area as a park is that the, the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary does not have a visitor center on this side of the bay. So I think that there's potential for having that element as long as a Cannery Row Museum, um, whether that's Stohans or something plus Stohans. That area is also where the visiting, the visiting busloads of people are dropped off. Um, and so it'd be nice to have an actual visitor center for the city of Monterey there so that they could go in and find out all, all about uh, what else is in Monterey besides just Cannery Row. Um, if you're back in 2000, I'm sorry to be so verbal here, but back in two, I, th I think this is an important, um, an important junction in, in the long road of first the Cannery Row Marketplace and then the Ocean View Plaza. Um, back in 2013, I had a grandson in school at Cal Poly, and so I got to know the department down there, and I have 16 park plans available if you're interested. Um, they're up on YouTube that they came here during the summer. Um, we gave them a tour of the row. Uh, the, the aquarium invited them in and gave them a tour of the aquarium. So they had some background uh, before they started to work on their um, design projects. Um, and I'm sure they'd be delighted to come back again, uh, different students, obviously, um, and do more of that sort of thing if it would be useful. Uh, but I, I just think it's, it's critical at this point that we just don't throw away this, all of this material when in fact we might be able to have something that really is another attraction. One more reason to spend a few more hours in Monterey. So um, with that, I'll shut up. Thank you, Bob. I can, I can send everybody, um, I can send everybody uh, a link to the YouTube uh, video that I did. It's about an hour long actually, because these kids did a very thorough job. But I'd like to try to inspire everybody to think about one more museum for the city of Monterey. I'd like you, Bob. Hi. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, I'm just saying, I, I, I like a lot of those ideas. I'd like to see the material that the Cal Poly folks uh, came up with. I spent a fair amount of time uh, today writing up my comments. And I can read them all to you, but Bob did a good job. He hit the key points and he had some uh, important information which I did not have. Essentially, um, my perspective is we have nothing on Cannery Row that talked about Cannery Row. And why do people go to Cannery Row? Because they read Steinbeck's book. Now when they go down there, they can buy a t-shirt and candy. And, and we should have something. We have the the worker shacks, but we don't have all this other stuff that puts things in perspective. And the whole thing with that development is a boondoggle since the beginning, because the building, from my understanding of the city planner at that time, the building was declared uh, that it had to be torn down because it was unsafe, because oops, one of the developers bulldozers ran into it. There was nothing wrong with the building, until they hit it with a bulldozer. 
So this whole thing is cascading down. And how, how are we now? 20 years later, nothing has happened. We have a cache of artifacts, the value of which we do not know, both interpretively and in hard cash. And if we get rid of them, they're gone. Whereas if we could put them together with the other artifacts on Cannery Row and perhaps get some partners so the city is not totally responsible for this, we can think big like Bob said and do something that we would all be proud of. I understand that's critical. You have a deadline, you have to do something. Um, I would like to see if Tamsi could delay uh, making us take these things out or if we could find a temporary spot to put them and maybe we form a subcommittee or something to look at this to see what the full spectrum of possibilities are uh, so that we can pick the best one. And it may be the one that is recommended. I don't know that. All I know is we didn't look at the other ones. So that's my test. I have a couple of love comments. Um, Lower Presidio Park has some storage buildings. I don't know what's in there, but you might look at that. Um, number two, I assume all the barrels, I didn't get to go to the uh, site visit, but um, those barrels are all empty barrels, I presume. They're not full of something. The other thing is, uh, I think these are good ideas, particularly the, the, the description that Bob gave of <clears throat> possibilities. But after we're uh, done with all this, and rather than just tossing, in some sense, the uh, remaining pieces, uh, a big yard sale in front of Colton Hall for people to take home a piece of uh, Cannery Row history would be a good way to dispose of the remnants, I think. I think a lot of people would just like to buy a piece of metal and put it in the, on their coffee table. Uh, actually, uh, the, that's it. That's uh, probably not a reasonable thing. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in going there was to see kind of what the scale of these things are. And from my point of view, I don't think there's anything worth putting outdoors alongside of the rec trail just for people to look at. Um, mm. the, they've, they're, they're, they're pretty good sized pieces of uh, probably a canning line and maybe a fish um processing line it, it's a little hard to tell and i'm not i'm not i i once consulted for um, van camp tuna in in san diego but uh, i didn't spend any time with the machinery so i was doing statistical analysis of the production line but it would be interesting to try to get somebody who has worked on or seen or engineered these kinds of things uh, to help us sort out what's there. It, there obviously is um, some pretty large structure um, and it, it, it would be interesting to, to try to reassemble that or reassemble the, the components. Um, there obviously was a fish grinder there. Um, there was some kind of giant intake uh, system. So th I think there's a lot of fascinating stuff there. It'd be, that's why I think it, it needs in some ways more analysis um, to, to see just exactly what we could do with it. Uh, Are there other comments from the commission? Inga, did you want to offer any more information? Uh, I'd like to hear what um... Commissioner Wall, if Commissioner Wall wants to comment, because she went and saw the pieces. Oops, you're mm -hmm. muted. They look to me worth saving a lot of them. Um, I said to a couple of you, you frequently see um, displays on private ranches or restaurants of old farm equipment and or railroad equipment. It has to be rusty, of course. And you look at it, and you go, oh, that's so interesting. And it's actually quite, quite eye-catching eye when it's set up like that. And I would love to take some of our pieces and set them up somewhere where they are. People could walk by and look at them. I think they're very eye-catching and they make you kind of think, well, 
what happened back then. And then in and of themselves with the spirals and the shapes and the circles and the, I mean, that just kind of appealed to, to the artistic part of me. Um, they're just kind of very attractive on their own. So I would like to think we could do something with them. And again, to, to glorify our, our history, like, you know, we're a pretty special place here. And that's one thing that we did. Um, I was thinking of the aquarium with all of their um, cannery um, equipment that they have there. You would think that we could get, make a connection with them somehow or another because they have all those, the, you know, the Hobden steamers and um, things that they man, man, manufacture the sardine products with. And I don't know how connected it would be. Ours doesn't look like theirs, but still rust has its own beauty, you know. I think another potential connection because this property that we're talking about is essentially kitty corner with the new education center. So that I think there's a potential tie in there with the aquarium in that their education center is within, I don't know, 50 yards of the ocean, assuming this is a park that had that those students would have access to. So that, um, yes, I think there's a potential for, for um, a connection with the aquarium, but not necessarily inside of their current buildings. No, they don't have any more room either, but they do have an interest in the history. Yes, I agree. It would be nice, I think, uh, as both Bob and Kathleen have said, that we did truly have an expert on cannery row equipment. I mean, Kent CV and Tim Thomas and Dennis Copeland are all very good people, but either somebody from the aquarium or somebody that the aquarium could tell us about to mm -hmm. go through this. Um, and as you know, if we did have a large piece of land like Ocean View Plaza, what could be used there and what wouldn't you know make sense? Mm -hmm. It'd be good to get another expert uh, to get an expert opinion, not another one, but a, right. an expert to look at it. I agree. I hate to just toss it. Do we have any other comments? It sounds to me like the first thing we need to do is try to get Tamsi to postpone the demolition of the building so that we have, we can find alternatives and find out the real value of this stuff from a, a, a historical operational point of view. Uh I think Kimber has something to say, but yeah. then I also wondered if Nat might have anything to say about Tamsi. Just, oh. a, just a clarifying question. Um, in the notes, it says May, uh, May 2021. Is it May 1st? Is it May 15th? Is it May 31st? What's the cutoff here? My original understanding was that it was by May. So ideally, May 1st rolls around and they look inside and they see an empty warehouse. So we all go out there after the meeting and put something in our truck and move it. <laughs> <laughs> we need a big forklift too. Well, they're huge pieces, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. 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 I think you should rent a tent and put it in a lower presidio parking lot. <laughs> so there's That's space right. there. They that have there was a comment about the lower presidio and I had thought of that as well, but we are um, tenants and it's the army's land. So the army would have to authorize us to um, store the pieces there. And, and I'm not sure that they would. I don't see be... why they would have to do that. Uh, I mean, if I park my car there, do they have to give me permission? Well, we're talking about, um, if it was just a couple of the little steamers, um, I think that would probably be okay. But if we're talking about, you know, most of that equipment, then I think that would be significant. But there is one building, you know, the building um, on the south side of the um, of the uh, the walkway, the harbor walkway. I know they use that for construction, but there is a building on the north side. And I'm not quite sure if it's completely empty or what use is there. I, I think it's worthwhile asking the army because that is a large building and there's some other areas. Do you know, uh, 
which building, Jordan, are you visualizing which building is the um, I'm not sure exactly. I, I do know that like at the blacksmith shop, there's just no room for these large pieces just because of what streets has in there. Um, the other but, building, I don't know. I've, I've I, seen military people over there, so I don't even know if we have those buildings or not. No, I was talking about the building, Jordan, just just south of the Goodwill where they relocated the Goodwill truck. I've never seen any use of that building at all. The building south of the trail, I know they use that a lot for construction and I see the military there. But the one by the Goodwill truck, again, I've never seen anybody in there. Yeah, that's where Streets is located. They have storage there. Um, so I've been in two of the three doors in there and the middle section is completely streets um they have signs of christmas decorations I see. the other section um there's a lot of stuff in there that is just there's no way to fit anything in there so Nat, did, did you have anything to, to add uh inga thought you might want to say something yeah no i, I just um what what Inga shared with us about the uh, time constraint, I think, is our biggest challenge right now. Our understanding is that uh, TAMC is already under contract to demolish that building next month. So uh, absent a plan to move the items or to identify which ones uh, are are not historically relevant and can be uh, can be uh, disposed of or, or recycled. Uh, we need to make a decision and the other challenges we don't have i mean we I don't we're, we're really stuck in terms of funding as well uh, even to uh destroy let alone relocate so um i don't know if inga has more information i don't i don't know if i don't recall inga you shared a lot about your conversation with tim and the inventory because not all of the items in there you're recommending that we destroy there are some historical artifacts can you describe a little bit more about the historical uh, you know, element on there. I think that might help us understand how to prioritize the items that are, are going to be kept and, and what your recommendation actually is. So my recommendation was actually considering what had been recommended by staff in 1997, which was to identify a few objects that would be suitable to be placed on the rec trail. And given um, concerns about how well things weather outdoors, and also the concern of um, not wanting to put anything that somebody could injure themselves on, um, you know, since the since the recommendation, we've we've had to close off the the train at uh, Dennis the Menace Park. So we know that we have to be really cautious about what we put out where the public can climb on it and so forth. So. I went in there looking with an eye for what might hold up outdoors and, um, you know, be suitable on the rec trail unsupervised, but with some interpretive signage. So that is the view that I went in there with. Um, there are, it appears to me that there are many miscellaneous pieces. I, my understanding was that San Xavier Cannery Warehouse was a warehouse for pieces of equipment. It wasn't that those pieces were all assembled into um, one operating structure. And so I don't know that they could be reassembled to demonstrate what a, um, what a pro uh, processing plant would have looked like or what a, a cannery line would have looked like because I believe they were stored from various properties but even if we couldn't rebuild a cannery line yeah uh, there are other techniques to fill in the blanks if we have original pieces that fit we can do interpretation on the missing parts uh, my concern is at this time if we decide to get rid of something it's gone Mm -hmm. And it may fit in to a later plan. Um, other commissions, I believe, in the beginning were involved in this cannery debacle and, and 
passed some decisions and we're left with the artifacts. I don't know if they have any reason to get involved at this time, but I would hate for our commission to take a decision that we're not authorized to take because somebody else has done something or said something and made a deal or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I just think this is more complicated than what we're talking about. And, and I think if we could buy ourselves some time, realizing we have to get the stuff out of there, then we have the luxury of giving it a little more analysis and coming up with the best solution we could come up with. I wonder if there are other warehouses on Fort Ord. I mean, Fort Ord is a huge piece of property. And are there other warehouses that are not being used that are scheduled for demolition way down the line that we could use it to store. Because also there's the cost of, you know, even if there was something at the lower Presidio, there's the cost of taking it from Fort Ord to the lower Presidio. Yeah. But I don't, think, I don't think it would take too long to check, Inga, if we just check with the Army and see if there's anything at lower Presidio, and then we can check with, um, I think it's Marina and Seaside, or uh, are there any other warehouses at Fort Ord that we can store? What about Ryan Ranch? Do we have any warehouse space or no? Maybe there's an empty hangar. We've really looked at all, all options. I, I don't know into how many hours you've spent, but I know we've talked to every uh, every staff member, looked at parking, uh, the parking garages, uh, parking division, Ryan Ranch. Uh, there, there really isn't, uh, even for a temporary basis, space to, uh, to relocate this. We've even talked about the lower Presidio, but right now we're uh, we're in discussion about uh, with the army on on some contract related matters as it relates to lower presidio. So it's it's really um, uh, I think a, a big a big challenge, and I, I really don't know whether we do we need to come back uh, to the commission with a more detailed list of items, uh, and then uh, and maybe call an emergency or a special meeting in, in a week or two to to revisit this, but. At the end of the day, we're going to have to decide uh, what to do. And if there's nowhere to put it, uh, then some of these items, um, and there is an interest in, in retaining it, uh, we're, we're, we're going to have to decide how much we're willing to spend out of the museum's budget to store items that may or may not be viable to be used even from a safety uh, standpoint. I, I don't know, a lot of many of you haven't had a chance to, to visit the, the site. I took some photos and Inga asked me to share these uh, uh, or, or suggested that perhaps I, I share them with all of you so that you can um, truly see what it's uh, what what some of these items um, look like. But uh, here, I'll, it's it's not I mean, some of these again, we're going to be able to, to retain, but uh, some of it not as much. Uh, you know, you've got. You can kind of see here. Um, I don't know if Inga, you can describe a little bit about each of these items briefly. Right. But the description we have is is pretty much, you know, metal object and the roughly the dimensions. They're they're in the inventory. It, it doesn't describe a whole lot about what they're used for, although um, there are some wooden carts that have wheels on them. Yeah. Uh, that earlier, I think you showed what's a hopper. There's those wooden barrels, uh, and there's uh, that large object there. That, and, um, and, and did what did Tim, both Tim Thomas and uh, I mean, who who we all know and regard as a, a expert? What did he say about these items? Did he say that there's some value that we can? Put these into a, a location. What was what were his thoughts? Well, his his recollection was that it was a lot of um, miscellaneous, uh, more or less junk at the time that we accepted it. Um, but he can see that there's some, you know, like there you have a, a wooden box that has the Del Monte logo on it, so that's nice to see. Um, but he didn't see them as as. Uh, treasured artifacts, which I was surprised given that he's a fisheries historian. 
Um, that's a motorcycle. We're not sure why and how that got into the mix. Um, one final comment from me. Um, it will take several months to do anything about this uh, in terms of dispersing the, the collection because you've got these other agents, you know, the Japanese people, the Italian people um, interested in getting some of it. You can't, you know, you can't do that in a month. Now, I think the only uh, action we can take to recommend is that we retain the entire collection while we start doing that and find a place to store it. I don't know what else we could do. So the Japanese American League said, uh, just tell us when you want us to take some pieces and we'll take them right away. So there, they understand that we're under this time constraint and they said they would make arrangements right away. I was told that the um, Italian Historical Society was interested, but they haven't reached out to me. So I need to follow up with them. Um, and then we can certainly, we can certainly form a, a subcommittee but I think we would have to have an emergency meeting after I've talked with Tamsi to see if, if Tamsi is able to give us more time. And uh, the cost of moving the pieces, I believe, would be significant because of their uh, magnet, their size and weight. And then we need to find an alternate location. I think um, Bill's suggestion that there might be some other storage facilities at Fort Ord is an interesting one because the uh, if we don't have to move them very far, that would be great. Um, but I believe we would have to be using museum funds to do this. And they may not have to be stored in in an interior space if for a short period. If we're talking about putting them on the wreck trail anyway, they're going to be exposed to the elements. So if we could find even just a place where we can fence them off, that might buy us the amount of time we need. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of places a four door that are just hard stand, we might be able to fence off. Let us. I'd like to add one last thought, and thanks for that, uh, which is I, I, I used to work in the food processing industry. That stuff out there is junk. Ninety-eight <laughs> percent at least, and we don't have the money to do anything with that stuff. And we ought to just—if we can beg somebody to take it off our hands without charging us a lot of money, we ought to do it now. So, thank you, Mike, for your comments. So it does occur to me—I mean—and of course. We know my credentials. I'm not a fisheries historian. I'm not a cannery historian. It does look to me like most of it is in a state where it will be hard to restore them without a lot of expense. And it does seem to me that there are other ways that we interpret our history when we don't have good, you know, quality artifacts that we can use for it. So I agree that a cannery museum would be a wonderful idea. I, we're in a really, really challenging time right now, um, monetarily. And so uh, my impression was that a lot of it is junk at this point. <laughs> could, do we know or could we just hands and see what they have? Because this may all be superfluous if they have all of that equipment in better shape. Okay. And it's going, it's supposed to be used for interpretation, is my understanding. The contractor was supposed to do that. So my understanding is the developer, what the developer has and is storing in Stohans is um, pieces from the building as the building was being torn down. I because see. they were supposed to reconstruct a building using some of the original pieces. Um, Bob was saying that there are also some artifacts in there, and that I hadn't heard that before. 
Is that right, Bob? That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess Nat was saying that, um, or maybe it was Inga, I don't know, but somebody mentioned that, um, well, names just go out of my head. Um, our planning director back in the sometime in in the in history had an inventory of what was in uh, mm. Stohans. Right. So so a um, a public request for uh, status of the inventory was um, received by the city in two thousand five, and so a re-examination of the index that you've all seen was done in 2005 and three pieces were found to be missing and then they also looked at what was in it was the planning department what was remaining in Stohans. so my understanding is there is an inventory from 2005 i haven't seen it but i can certainly uh look into that and it's possible that there are some pieces of equipment in good shape i don't know so I can definitely do that. So it sounds like find out about the inventory, um, find out uh, about from Tamsi. And other four door locations. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a good question is, um, you know, the amount of the, Art acquisition fund that the um, commission would want to commit to storing, moving and storing the equipment. The bill for locating it in 1997 <clears throat> to Fort Ord was um, about twelve thousand okay. dollars. Do how much money is in our acquisition art acquisition fund? Inga, do you know? I don't know off the top of my uh, head. That's a good question. That's fine. Yeah. So um, when we find out these important details, should we try to reconvene? Or do you want to work with a smaller group? Or what do you think is best? Any, any comments? I'm happy Shall we to try to get another? I think from the city manager's office, there's some work to be done on the on the back end, uh, and again, I can regroup with our our team, and uh, and provide a some some more insight, uh, perhaps based on the questions that you have that we're not able to answer uh, right away, and um, we'll be able to come back to you with uh, information on funding, uh, as well as I don't know if we included in the in the packet, but we do have the. Uh, policy that uh, talks about how do we uh, deaccession? Yeah, exactly. Um, it says, for example, the object if it's in deteriorating condition or we lack for the division lacks the resources and expertise necessary to house, maintain, and preserve the object, or the physical deterioration has removed the identifying characteristics. Uh, those are some criteria for which we we shouldn't be maintaining or or keeping these items. And I'll just reemphasize at the end of the day, it's about priorities. If, if money was no object, we would keep everything and, and pay, pay funds to store these items in, in a storage unit and whatever, whatever it costs. But just reminding, you know, this group, I know it's hard to let go of objects, but when we have historians who know the area, who know uh, the history uh, of of these objects, and uh, and we all believe so strongly in historic preservation and and, and keeping uh, our our history. When you have folks like Tim Thomas who say this is junk, uh, to me it, it it it's a big reminder that it's junk, and we probably should get rid of it as hard as it is to to let go of, of it. Uh, and, and I'm saying the majority of the items, not all of them. So um, I, I know that may not impact your decision today, but it's just part of part of the narrative to, to keep in mind um, in terms of our staff's recommendation. I know Inga, you spoke with Dennis Copeland as well, our former arch archives and museums manager, and his recommendation was to not hang on to these items as well. So 
uh, just just keep. I would we, we urge you in this fiscal crisis to keep that in mind as we discuss whether or not we want to keep these items permanently that have been in storage for decades. So one of the things that I considered was, would we have accepted this gift today? And I, using our um, our acquisitions guidelines from city council, I think we would have said, no, we, we can't accept the gift because we don't have the expertise and the staffing and the funds to maintain it. So that would be if, if somebody was offering it to us today. So now that we have it, we know that we don't have the funds, the staff expertise to maintain it. So is I was thinking we might keep a few pieces, but then find folks who would be able to keep some pieces and do something with it. And that would be the developers who are supposed to be building a museum. Although uh, Commissioner Evans has a, quite a bit of information about that. I've heard um, maybe the aquarium, it was suggested today, maybe the aquarium would have some interest. I know JCL said they would come by and, and pick up a few pieces. Their board did meet on the 4th of April, I think, and um, said that they, Inform me they would do so. So those would be my recommendations. Can I make another another final comment? Sure. Uh, and that is <laughs> that if uh, we can reach a, a consensus that there's no need to retain any of this uh, material, we could just set up an open house where anybody who wanted, including the J Japanese group and the Italians, could come during a, a week and take away anything they want. And then we just get rid of what's left. Throw it out. Except for the barrels, I would say most of that, it's, you're not gonna just walk in and pick it up and take it out. These things are heavy. Um, so well, but you're gonna need a fork. You'll find a few people that'll do things that you never expected. But um, I don't know what else to do about it. We can have another meeting, but we're not going to have any more information to decide anything on. Well, if we do get some more information, um, one one thing I think that makes the decision difficult is they're not all laid out in front of us. And even when we went in there, they were all kind of mushed together with no light. So it was hard to really make a good decision. And we know that Tim went through there but it might be that we would have to go through with him so he could explain why he's saying these things. So we're, we're all comfortable with what we do. Right. So that sounds like, it, oh yes. I just wanna say, I feel like I'm hearing that though in all of this, the caveat that it's not all of the pieces that would be uh you know carted away that there's a few pieces that would be kept and i'm wondering like who who would make that decision and about how many pieces do we think would be kept or am i mishearing no i think you're hearing correctly and i think that depends on what we see as the use in the future if we're going to do this um, I think Bill mentioned an outdoor museum with pieces from Cannery Row. That's one thing we could keep more uh, because it's just interesting this came out of a cannery. But if we're going to do something more specific, smaller, uh, with more interpretation in a, in a smaller space, then some of that stuff could probably go without any question. Some of it is um, going to fall apart anyway. Yeah. Oh, so the, the answer is the answer is still murky. Like we don't have yeah. a solid decision yeah. on like no. which pieces and how many there would be that we would keep. And if Sorry, you, Bill, I interrupted you. I believe if that's retain, the case. If you do retain what, pieces, you still have to find a place to retain them. At. Yeah. What I was going to suggest yeah, so is in, that Inca, my understanding, and Inca can correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry to interrupt. Is that you, there are a, you have a list correct of the items and specifically which ones the Japanese American Citizens League is interested in keeping which items the uh, Italian American Association is 
interested in keeping and which ones we're planning to move to or we would like we're recommending to move to the uh, the garage uh, one of our parking garages where we do have a limited space so i don't know if inga can clarify that for us hey. So my recommendation would be to keep a couple of the fish steaming baskets and to keep one of the uh, large floats. And those seem like they would um, hold up the most in the outdoor installation. Uh, but I was going to suggest being... those, Inga, those are for the city to retain, correct? Correct. And the other pieces, while they're really interesting, would be have too many liability issues around them because they're sharp and um, that sort of thing. And which what I was going to suggest is that oh. sorry, sorry, no. sorry no. I was going to suggest if if Inga could um, ask Tim Thomas to come one more time and to see if the aquarium aquarium has an expert on cannery row equipment and maybe meet with a small subcommittee with staff and a small subcommittee possibly John and Bob to go out on the site uh, in the next couple of weeks and just to go through that list and look at all the remaining stuff and, and then come back, you know, we may have to have a special meeting then after that. But if we had, if we had two commission members as well as Tim Thomas and possibly somebody from the aquarium with city staff go out there and go through the, uh, all the materials. I have a list of about 30 items that I thought were potentially of interest. Okay. And it's not in a couple weeks. It's like now, right? I mean, as soon May as 1st we, is, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, as soon as we can, it's next. unless we can get an extension from TAMC. Uh, they don't always finish their projects on time either. So maybe <laughs> there's a little slippage in this thing. But we can't put it off, that, that's certain. And then we would have a special meeting where the subcommittee could, the ad hoc committee could report back. Right. Yes. And staff Does that could- that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, Bob, are you okay with being on that? Absolutely. Anyone else wanna participate? Bill, would you you have a good sense for the facilities in the city? You you have some ideas beyond what I could come up with. Oh, you mean for the stuff to be stored at? Yeah, yeah, I or think, where it might go eventually. Yeah, I think as that. I mean, I think it's a simple call to the army, and then one to the the city of Marina and Seaside about the warehouses at Fort Ord. So I don't, okay. I mean, I would be glad to follow up with them, although the city's supposed to deal with the army directly. Yes, yes, okay. All I right. think the question was, did you wanna be on a subcommittee with uh, Commissioner Evans or should it be uh, Chair O'Neill? Oh no, I think John, well, I would say John and, um, and Bob would make a good subcommittee. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm willing to do that. So we have a consensus on this, I think. Yeah. Uh, Francesca, do we need to ask for public comment at this point? Yes. Okay. And for any Would you viewers, please do that? Yes. For any viewers watching, we do invite you to make a public comment. If you are here live on Zoom, you can raise your Zoom hand. If you'd like to join by phone, please dial toll-free 833-568-8864. Enter meeting ID 161-622-2299, followed by the pound sign. If prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. We do encourage members of the public to join our meeting via ZoomGov. You will be connected live in real time to the meeting. Toronto, there are no callers. Thank you. And we'll close public comment and bring it back to the commission. I think we've done what, in some fashion, what we were supposed to do today. So that that's the agenda.
except for commissioner's comments. Is that correct? Well, since it was a approved, um, since the report before you was a request to approve, do you have to make a motion? I'll move to table. Okay, thank you. I'll second. Is there any discussion? We don't discuss a move to table. I'm sorry? You do not discuss a move to table. You do, you I'm sorry. When I sit around my table, there's always discussions. <laughs> but, but thank you for the correction. Sometime, then. No, you're you're right. You, you know that better than I. Okay. So, do we vote? Yes. All righty. Would you please, Francesca? Commissioner Castagna? Yes. Commissioner Evans? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Sovereign? Yes. Commissioner Wall? Muted. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Vice Chair Wachowski? Yes. Chair O'Neill? Yes. Thank you all. Okay, we've uh, unanimously tabled that item. <laughs> Actually, you need a motion to table to table a motion. You're confusing me, John. <laughs> well, you can't table a discussion. You can table a motion. And we oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, um, ignore me. Yeah. No. No. The effect is the same. Yeah. Yes. We just did it differently in the Marine Corps. You over there. That's all. I don't think I'm I've sorry. heard of you. <laughs> worked well in the Marine Corps. Okay, so do we proceed now to the commissioner's comments? Yes. Thank you. Anyone have any comments? No, nope. Bob. I just want to thank everybody for for listening to my um, plea to think about the future. Because I think that's that's an important uh, step. It's been almost 30 years since they started talking about doing something at that site on Cannery Row, and it, at when and that's when I tuned in on it. And my understanding was that it it had been it had been vacant for at least 20 years before that. So it's a shame that that beautiful piece of property isn't open to the public. And that's where I'd like us to see go see it go at some point. Thank you. John? No comments. Bill? No, no comment. Mike? Kimber has comments. I, I would uh, just add to what was said a moment ago that uh, we aren't going to fix 50 years within the next month. No. That's correct. Kimber? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, so I, on Saturday, and this is a completely in a completely different uh, on a, in a different um, story. Anyway, <laughs> on Saturday, I was uh, privileged to be a judge in the first uh, youth history slam and it was just fantastic so i think it was like somewhere around 20 kids seventh to 12th grade something like that it was just really wonderful and a great group of judges and we had a really good deliberation afterwards so i highly recommend that event and look forward to it again next year thank you thank you and and the it was videotaped and the videotape is being worked on. And so in a couple of weeks, we hope to have that videotape up. There were really some incredible presentations from some very young folks who are interested in history. So that's encouraging. It is, thank you. Kathleen, do you have any comments? I have to worry about my dog snoring. No, nothing today, thank okay. you very much. All right, thank you. I have uh, two comments. Um, I was able to visit the Emil Norman house on Saturday. Emil Norman, if, if you know, was a very talented artist who lived on Pfeiffer Ridge in Big Sur. 
um, and he died. A nonprofit has been formed to preserve his house, home, and all of the artwork in it, and to um, begin some kinds of programs like artists in residence, have the artists go out to schools, maybe involve students, and they're in the early stages. Uh, it was worth going to. And I mentioned to them that I sit on this commission and therefore they would like to commission the visit if you want to visit. Um, and I can recommend that. It, it was interesting. First of all, you can't go there unless they let you in. <laughs> so you're going someplace nobody else is going to go. And it was just very interesting. Um, so if we want to do that, we can set something up with them. That and, sounds great. And we have a couple of Emil Norman pieces in that, the city's collection. They know that. <laughs> I think they want to talk to you about it. <laughs> they do want to talk to me. <laughs> if any of you can well, see an yeah. organ, it's uh, there's What's organ. that, John? The organ there is very impressive. If any of you are uh, keyboard players, you should take the Oh, organ. yes. You're right. Yeah. There's a video, I think, on PBS, uh, KQED, or someplace. I saw it on KQED. Uh, interviews with him and touring the house and the organ and all that. Yeah. My second thing is um, we've opened for tours again at the Pointer Naval Facility. And if we are interested in going there for a tour, um, be happy to set that up for us. Um, if you're interested, it could be with the public or without whatever we have to do. But it's an old rundown place that we're trying to make not so rundown. But the story is good. Can we uh, use it for storage, maybe? For the, uh... You know, I was thinking about that. Unfortunately, we are storing a bunch of stuff from the light station that's historic down there. Um, and it's a long haul to get down there, but we don't have much storage space. So I think that's it then. Shall we adjourn? All right. Thank you. Okay. See everybody Thank you. next month.